You might be thinking, who is this Harry Potter girl? <laughs> UN Women's Global Goodwill Ambassador. If not me, who? It is time that we all perceive gender on a spectrum. Where have you been in terms of your gender and your gender identity? Women are choosing not to identify as feminist. I'm a feminist! This has to stop. Such an inspiration and why I feel like crying when listening to her. These are a few of the tons of positive comments to Emma Watson's viral UN speech, an iconic speech which paved the way for speeches and interviews about equality ever since. However, is the speech actually inspiring? Is it well argued or are there fundamental flaws? What do you think about the speech? Let us know in the comments. Time to get the show on the road. And now let's turn to a young woman who has chosen to lend her voice to this very important solidarity movement. She's a leading British actor and the UN Women's Global Goodwill Ambassador, Emma Watson. Solidarity Movement, Global Goodwill Ambassador. I feel like I'm in the control room for buzzwords. And as we know, UN only hires authentic ambassadors who totally aren't in it for themselves. American TV and film actress and UN Women's Advocate for Political Participation and Leadership, Meghan Markle. Good evening. That doesn't feel like enough, does it? It's just great evening. Maybe that's better. It was at that moment that I realized the magnitude of my actions. Today, we are launching a campaign called He For She. I am reaching out to you because we need your help. They call it a speech, goodwill and solidarity, distracting from the fact that it's just like any other sales pitch. The speaker has something, a product, campaign or message they want us to buy and believe. Knowing this, we should be aware of the potential oversimplifications and generalizations Watson uses in order to convince us into buying her message and campaign. We want to end gender inequality. And to do this, we need everyone involved. Here and throughout her speech, Watson's skilled at using effective prosody, which is a way of manipulating one's voice to convey emotion, pathos. It could be via pitch, breathy voice and emotional pauses. Watson is particularly fond of pauses. Her pleading and arguably forced facial expressions underline this pathos tactic. The urgency and importance or self-importance, depending on how you look at it, of what she's about to claim. Also, what is it that she presupposes? She presupposes the word inequality, as if everybody automatically agrees with it, and as if it has the same meaning in all of the contexts she's about to mention. When someone says they want to end something as big as inequality, it's oversimplifying and thus potentially disingenuous. Let's see what happens. We want to try and galvanize as many men and boys as possible to be advocates for change. Change is a cliché with positive connotations. Maybe that's why she says it with such solemnity. For change. For change. Politicians build entire campaigns based on this word, and similarly empty words. I was appointed as Goodwill Ambassador for UN Women six months ago. And the more I've spoken about feminism, the more I have realised that fighting for women's rights has too often become synonymous with man-hating. You don't have to be a goodwill ambassador, which he actually manages to say unironically, to know that. And I've absolutely no idea why some people still perceive it that way. I mean, every single spokesperson I've heard is so balanced and rational in their views. USC Annenberg's inclusive initiative released findings that 67% of the top critics were white males. Were white males. Am I saying that I hate white dudes? No, I'm not. I do not need a 40-year-old white dude to tell me what didn't work for him about A Wrinkle in Time. I don't hate white dudes. These are just facts. These are not my feelings. <sighs> I went to Rwanda. So many of the men were lost in the genocide, so it gave women an opportunity to find some strength and then mobilize in a way that was really empowering. And I think that's specifically what they've done, which is a great benchmark for what women all over the world could be doing. Come synonymous with man-hating. If there is one thing I know for certain, it is that this has to stop. 
It's one thing to wish for something to stop for self-serving reasons. It's another thing to assign blame to the people whose opinions you want to stop. Who's wrong and why are they wrong? She doesn't tell us because ambiguity is the glue of politics. It allows people to agree on laws and policies because they can read different meanings into the words. Deliberate vagueness leads to less disagreement and less disagreement makes persuasion easier. Conveniently, she doesn't even deal with counter-arguments. They simply have to stop. For the record, feminism by definition is the belief that men and women should have equal rights and opportunities. For the record, for the record is an appeal to alleged shared knowledge that her definition is the only correct one and that she shouldn't even have to mention it, even though it's the most important part of the speech as it lays the foundation for everything that follows it. And things aren't that easy because time and time again there's been a battle about the word equality. Is she talking about equality of opportunity or equality of outcome? Because these two definitions are vastly different. And this woman walked up to me and she said, um, she said, well, we made a condition of the license that they hire women in technical positions and you were one of them. It's really put me in a position to make decisions. That was the beginning. That was, that was the opportunity that afforded me that position. Boards. You've introduced a bill, C25, to increase female representation on boards. To essentially sort of shame corporations into doing it, you nod. That's exactly it. And making people uh, actually explicitly say what their plan is to bring more women onto boards, more diversity into their boards. Maybe Watson should consult with allies like Kathleen Kennedy and Justin Trudeau or simply tell the audience what she really means because with the definition she gives she hasn't defined the term sufficiently. Practically no one would disagree with what she's saying, so what she's saying here can't be the part that people disagree with her about. But then again she chose to be deliberately vague about the disagreement, so apparently this is where deliberate vagueness leads. This has to stop. I started questioning gender-based assumptions a long time ago. When I was eight, I was confused at being called bossy because I wanted to direct the plays that we would put on for our parents. But the boys were not. Gender-based assumptions is the label Watson ascribes to the anecdotal experiences she presents, which, in terms of proof, would require her to be able to causally link the description bossy to her gender. That's why anecdotal evidence isn't evidence for anything. The audience has no way of evaluating if the speaker suffered an injustice because of their gender, or because they weren't talented enough, or were bossy. Some people, irrespective of gender, are bossy and make bad leaders. I'd be curious to know how far she'll take the expression gender-based assumptions. Some children figure out their gender really early they're figuring out their gender identity is not necessarily congruent with their sex assigned at birth. And how I put it in words for kids so that they can understand it is, tell me your story. Where have you been in terms of your gender and your gender identity? Where are you right now? So medical affirmation begins when the patient says they're ready for it. You are being malignant and harmful. The terms Watson uses open the door for this kind of radical social constructivism, and it's very convenient that she doesn't set boundaries or properly defines the terms she's using. Next, she continues with anecdotes as the pathos in her voice and pleading facial expressions are about to escalate. With the anecdotes and pathos, she's encouraging the audience to simply take her word for it. When at 15, my girlfriends started dropping out of their beloved sports teams because they didn't want to appear muscly. Because anecdotal evidence isn't actual argumentation, it raises unwanted questions. In this case, it's the question, what about all those who didn't care about appearing too muscly and continued with their beloved sports? Could there be biological and neurological gender differences that affect the choices men and women make in life on average? Because her views rest on social constructivism, she makes no such reflections or distinctions. From her perspective, men and women make choices based on expectations and pressure first and foremost. Good thing Watson's here to free us from the choices we make, but I'm getting ahead of myself. When at 18, my male friends were unable to express their feelings. Obviously, Watson has no problem expressing her feelings because the pathos in her voice is starting to affect her pronunciation. 
were unable to express, to express, to express. Also, what does expressing their feelings even mean? Expressing their feelings in a way she approves of. Feelings include happiness, sadness, anger. So which feelings, specifically? Like in any other sales pitch, all that matters, apparently, is pandering to the target group, men and boys, no matter how repetitive, ambiguous and generalizing it is. Repetitive because the point about men not expressing their feelings, whatever that even means, is as old as time itself. I decided that I was a feminist. Women are choosing not to identify as feminist. Yes, and we can't have that. No, they must identify with the group and not identify as the individuals they are with their own opinions and thoughts. The ironic thing about Watson's indignation, or pretend indignation, is that in the midst of her inclusive and tolerant rhetoric, she indirectly shames the audience in case they don't identify the way she wants them to identify. Next, we observe the thin line between self-pity and self-aggrandizement. Apparently, I am among the ranks of women whose expressions are seen as too strong, too aggressive, isolating, and anti-men, unattractive even. She invites the audience to also find it unfair that she gets all these labels when all she wants, presumably, is equality. However, that goes back to her deliberate vagueness, not making it clear what kind of equality she supports, and also not addressing the literally unequal nature of equality of outcome. Thus, because she's been deliberately vague, it can be difficult for audience members to judge whether or not these labels are fair. The words too strong are exposed to self-praise because critics would never criticize her for being too strong. I am among the ranks of women too strong. So this tells us something about how Watson turns criticism into self-praise, very likely as a coping mechanism, and also how she wants the audience to perceive her as strong. I am from Britain. And I think it is right that I am paid the same as my male counterparts. This is a classic objection, completely overlooking the demands of the market and the fact that money is given to individuals, not to groups. To Watson and like-minded people, men and women should view themselves as members of a group first and foremost, not as individuals with opinions and goals that might differ from other people in their group, despite their shared characteristics, and who have to compete on the same terms as everybody else, with the same consequences and sacrifices. Individuals who do well in the market, who deliver what people want to see, hear and buy, get more money, irrespective of their innate characteristics. It's almost as if people are treated as individuals and not as group members. What a radical notion. I think it is right that I should be able to make decisions about my own body. I think... I like how UN people only applaud opinions that are well-argued and specific. It makes me feel certain that these are the people most fit to basically tell us all what to do and think. It's interesting to note that she lumps completely different areas together, as if equality is an umbrella term for them all, as if the areas are identical and the connection between them is understood by everyone. The rhetorical style in the speech isn't designed to persuade skeptics, it's designed to encourage fellow believers that they're on the right side and track, and that their adversaries just need a little guidance. I think it is right that women be involved on my behalf in the policies and the decisions that will affect my life. I think it is right that socially I am afforded the same respect as men. But sadly, I can say that there is no one country in the world where all women can expect to receive these rights. No one country? Really? The fact that she's stating the obvious like this suggests that equality of opportunity isn't all Watson wants. Because if this is all she wants, there'd be no conflict. So there must be something else she wants, something she's deliberately vague about. I think it is right that socially, I am afforded the same respect as men. What does she even mean by respect? In what instances and in what way? 
Who is she even speaking to? Because of the vagueness, it's hard or impossible to tell. And the most interesting point, the fact that her groupthink prevents her from seeing the world as it actually is. Because generally, you earn respect and lose respect as an individual. Not because of your innate characteristics, not because of your group status. All it takes to refute her contrived arguments is to ask simple counter-questions like Are all men involved in decision-making? Are all men respected? The shocking answer is a resounding no. Good thing this speech isn't held at one of the most powerful organizations in the world. Wait. My school did not limit me because I was a girl. So I guess being called bossy, in case she ever was, wasn't so traumatizing after all. I was confused being called bossy. Men. I would like to take this opportunity to extend your formal invitation. <laughs> the thing about invitations is that people, irrespective of gender, like to know what they're being invited to. With anecdotal evidence, which isn't evidence at all, and circular opinions about what she's entitled to, like, I deserve respect because I deserve respect, Watson hasn't made the invitation clear at all. We don't even know which definition of equality she subscribes to, how radical it is, and if she'd be willing to call out fellow believers in equality in case they go too far. No, all counter-arguments simply have to stop. This has to stop. This Ironically, this clip comes across as the most honest in this speech, how she really feels about opposing views that expose the circularity of her arguments. I'm still waiting for my invitation to the UN, so I can speak my truth in an inclusive way. I must say, I feel excluded and marginalized. I've seen my father's role as a parent being valued less by society, despite my needing his presence as a child as much as my mother's. If she believes that's the case, that wouldn't have anything to do with inequality master's equality policies, would it? That people from her side enforce on a daily basis. Also, if she believes that's the case, what will she do about it? What does being less valued even mean? Ambiguity truly is the glue of politics. I've seen young men suffering from mental illness, unable to ask for help, for fear it would make them less of a man, or less of a man. Mental health is spoken of like never before, depression and stress being two of the most common. So again, what about all the men who aren't afraid to talk about it? And what does this have to do with being less valued as a father? And how is she able to causally link men's alleged fear of talking about their mental health to how they'll be perceived? The speech is more sporadic than the plot in the room. Just a chicken. Chip, 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 chip. They betrayed me. They didn't keep their promise. They tricked me, and I don't care anymore. Chip, 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 chip. Chip, 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 chip. Chip, 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 chip. I've seen men made fragile and insecure by a distorted sense of what constitutes male success. Point is, what are you doing about it? I'm gonna finish my workout. Life will always contain moments of being fragile and insecure. That's inescapable. However, moments of fragility and insecurity also often make people stronger in the long run. No matter how each individual defines success, it doesn't have to be money and status. Then again, Watson doesn't look at people as individuals. She looks at people as group members, which is why her observations are as bland and unspecific as this. However, that doesn't stop her from trying to use these superficial observations as a stepping stone to a rather big claim. Let's watch. Men don't have the benefits of equality either. So what is the end goal of this campaign? When will Watson and like-minded people think we have enough equality? When pronouns like he or she are rendered obsolete? I'm a feminist! We have to create a safe space. Whatever your, your gender, your preferred pronouns blossom to, to be, we all know it ain't so black and white. We don't often talk about men being imprisoned by gender stereotypes, but I can see that they are, and that when they are free, things will change for women as a natural consequence. Free of what, exactly? And what will this natural consequence look like in terms of laws and policies, for example? 
What is it she's not telling us? Stereotype is another cliché that speakers like to use because it makes them seem in touch and morally good or superior. However, as a term, it oversimplifies the fact that men and women, on average, and when they're free to choose, don't make the same decisions in life and don't always want the same things either. Also, stereotype is a word that implicitly or explicitly shames the people that live up to the stereotype. And in this case, Watson doesn't even properly define what she means. That would cause disagreement, and we can't have that. Next, she reveals her real mindset. If men don't have to be aggressive in order to be accepted, women won't feel compelled to be submissive. Who says that men have to be aggressive in order to be accepted? This wouldn't happen to be Watson's stereotype of a stereotype, would it? You're going back inside, buddy. But you back off, Slade. Just back off! Perhaps she's not so inclusive after all. Who would have thought? Also, just a few minutes ago, she said that people perceived her as aggressive. I am among the ranks of women too aggressive. There are quite a few indicators that Watson isn't the right person to define what counts as being aggressive and what counts as simply being competitive and strong-willed. It is time that we all perceive gender on a spectrum instead of two sets of opposing ideals. If <laughs> this goes to show that applause can be misleading. Today, the results of Watson's mindset are everywhere. Male gametes. That's what makes me male. No. In truth, okay. Whose truth are we talking about? Well, I mean, I think when someone tells you who they are, you should believe them. So if a person says that they're a woman or they're a man, then that's them telling you their gender is. You keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. What is a woman? It, for me, it's, it's actually a really simple answer, and that's a person who identifies as a woman. But what are they identifying as? As a woman. I but but what is that? As a woman. Do you know what a circular definition is? If we stop defining each other by what we are not and start defining ourselves by who we are, we can all be freer. And this is what he she is about. It's about freedom. What would sound good in a B-movie or a speech at the UN, potato potato, doesn't always make logical sense. When people define themselves as something, they most often implicitly define themselves as opposed to something else. All words have synonyms as well as antonyms. If a person says she's energetic, she implicitly says she's not lazy and so on. So in other words, what she says can't be the real way to get to where she wants. Because linguistically, it's already happening. Has she really thought this through? What would happen if people didn't define themselves by what they're not? That kind of anything goes mentality would make the world a scary place to be. And finally, freedom to what exactly? Freedom to believe the same as her. That gender is a spectrum. That isn't freedom, that's the epitome of living up to a stereotype, a new stereotype, one that conveniently supports her financial ambitions at the UN. I want men to take up this mantle, so that their sons have permission to be vulnerable and human too reclaim those parts of themselves they abandoned, and in doing so, be a more true and complete version of themselves. Presupposing that they aren't already being a true and complete version of themselves, regardless of the speech in the UN. In speeches like this, we gradually learn that the speaker's inclusivity is indistinguishable from exclusivity. Watson replaces one stereotype with another, under the guise of caring. You might be thinking, who is this Harry Potter girl? <laughs> and what is she doing speaking at the UN? Statesman Edmund Burke said, all that is needed for the forces of evil to triumph is for good men and women to do nothing. This is one of the most overused quotes of all time. And to use it to put an emotional ending to this unspecific mess of a speech is as meaningless as the speech itself. What exactly are people supposed to infer from this quote that what she calls aggressiveness, but which might just be competitiveness and willpower, is evil? That it's evil to call bossy people bossy? Because the speech is all over the place and she uses equality as an umbrella term, these forces of evil aren't properly defined. 
However, the absence of details and pretty much anything original don't stop Watson from taking that self-promotional moment, distracting from her financial interest in the sales pitch. I mean speech. Goodwill Solidarity Movement speech. Sorry. In my nervousness for this speech, and in my moments of doubt, I've told myself firmly, if not me, who? If not now, when? Yeah, because no one could have lived without this information, so I'm glad she overcame her nervousness. I mean, it's not like men have ever been told to express their feelings and that people have been told to choose what they want in life. The speech is full of brand new information. Vague claims like these are how we know that there's more to what Watson says, otherwise there'd be no reason for stating the obvious. She wants something more in terms of funding, but also in terms of equality, one of the most deceptive words of our time. We are struggling for a uniting word, but the good news is that we have a uniting movement. It is called He for She. A uniting movement in case you agree with it. What we've seen here is an example of a speech which lacks specificity, cohesion between the different areas of inequality and precise definitions of the terms used. Yet people are convinced into thinking that this is inspiring and original by the very same people Watson's making calculating emotional appeals to. Feel free to click the like button and subscribe for more uniting videos. Have a nice and inspiring day.